welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you all have come along. I have been waiting for this day for a long time because I have a special guest on who I've admired for a long time. I've watched videos, I've read his books, I've said his name hundreds of times, and now he's going to be here. But before I get to introduce our guest today, I want you to know that this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. We do that through a variety of academic programs, from bachelor's to master's degrees. Master of Divinity, of course, is our you know standard degree, and then also doctor of ministry programs. Then we have a variety of lay initiatives that are available as well. So check us out at wbs.edu. Secondly, I want you to make, make sure people know of a new resource that's coming from my website, andymillerthe3rd.com, it's Andy Miller, I, 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 and it is a six-week small group video study of the book of Jude called Contender, and this study, is it's interesting how God is using it in this time because there are several churches within the Methodist kind of world, particularly United Methodists who are becoming global Methodists, who are thinking about the disaffiliation process. And this is like addressing that very particular situation as people, as churches, like what happens in Jude's situation is a group of leaders have secretly slipped in who are distorting the faith. And so he calls in the contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So I would love for you to check out this study contender and uh, it's available just at my website again. So check that out. And finally, I'm thankful to WPO Development who helps me make all this what makes this happen, what helped me pay for all the resources to make this go. And they are a team that helps people with feasibility studies, capital campaigns, mission planning studies. And they've done that for more than 250 churches and organizations around the country. Their CEO, Keith Waters, is a friend of mine and um, he really supports this podcast. So you can check out a link to him and WPO development in the show notes. And if you don't mind taking a minute just to share a, a link to this, uh, like it, share it on Facebook, whatever you can do that helps this message get out more. All right, here it is. I am so glad to welcome in Dr. Brian Fickert. Brian, I am a huge fan of your, you can't even believe it. Like I, if I had a poster in my bedroom, you might be on it. <laughs> you gotta get out more, Andy. <laughs> it's no, a to be with you. Man, I thank you so much for coming on this podcast. And it took us a little bit while ago. We were sharing so much before I pressed record. So uh, it's, it really means a lot. I, I, I mean it. I have, I have said your name so much. We used a video series that you did to train staff, boards. Uh, when Helping Hurts is such a, uh, I think, a book that's going to be remembered for a long time and is so useful. So thank you so much for writing. But we're here today to talk about the kind of, I don't know if you call it a sequel or a prequel, but it's it's- yeah, so becoming whole, why the opposite of poverty isn't the American dream. So it's both a prequel and sequel. Tell me what you mean. Yeah, so uh, we wrote When Helping Hurts, and God used that book in ways we never could have imagined. And then what happened is uh, a lot of people come up to me like at a conference or something and say, you know, I'm working with this particular people group on an island in the Pacific, and they have this particular issue. What do I do? I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. And nobody <laughs> knows what to do. The, the, the questions were so specific. I realized that what people really needed was wisdom, that, that, that I couldn't possibly give them the formula for every situation. I thought they just need wisdom. They need to know kind of what is God's story? What, what are the goals that God is trying to achieve? And how does he typically go about achieving those goals? Interesting. And, and I realized people didn't know the biblical story very well. And then I realized that we as a people had lost our sense of story, that, that America has lost its way, that, that we don't know what human flourishing looks like anymore. We don't know how to achieve it. And so there's kind of this irony that we're trying to help poor people to become like us, but we're right. miserable. And so right. we needed a better story. So Becoming Whole uh, tries to develop more of a framework uh, to help people to live into God's story. And I think in some ways it was there in When Helping Hurts. It was kind of lurking, but this is a fuller understanding of that. And that's because, quite frankly, I've continued to learn and to grow. I don't think I could have said all this stuff at the time we wrote When Helping Hurts. So it's it's the underlying stuff behind When Helping Hurts, but it's more. Right. It's, it, for instance, one of the things we, we want to do, and one of the reasons When Helping Hurts is, is so 
powerful. It's like helping us see like beyond just the immediate band-aid sort of response that we have. So, okay, I'll give you an example. So for instance, I, I began, and, and other writers have been helpful who've been on my podcast or uh, for instance, Brent Waters. I don't know if you know him, um, his book on capitalism really, really helpful to me. But, but, but you two together and Steve, who is your co-author and, and, and this author too, Kelly, I, who I'm, I'm interested, like I, I would say like the way we solve homelessness in this given town, like wherever I was serving, particularly like I think my last appointment in Tampa, Florida, was that we give people access to the market. Okay, that's, that, and that honestly works, but it doesn't necessarily answer the questions that people have. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's, that might solve the problem, but wh where do we want people to go? And I, and I think that that's what you're after here is like, not just getting people out of poverty, but what, what is the answer? Like where, who are we called to be? Oh, that's it. You know, um, it's interesting. So I'm an economist. I love yeah. economics. I love markets. I love capitalism, but there's a funny thing going on. Uh, if you actually look at uh, uh, well-being in America, it's not improving. And, and if you actually look at anxiety and depression, those have been steadily increasing from the 1930s to the present. So there's this irony that the, the, uh, the wealthiest nation in the world, the, uh, uh, during a period of unprecedented economic growth, anxiety and depression have continued to rise. It's not just recent, it's not just the iPhones. This goes back to the 1930s, all the way to the present. Why is that? There's a further irony. As globalization is spreading Western style capitalism to the rest of the world, we're seeing material poverty plummet. Right. Uh, the percentage of people living below uh, $1.90 per day has, has been reduced by about 50% in the past 25 years. But at the same time, in those very places where there is increased economic prosperity, there's less self-reported happiness and greater anxiety and depression. So mm. something is wrong here. How can we understand this? We need a different story. Wow. So the, the answer isn't just more stuff. I, I think you kind of get at this in the subtitle of the book, why the opposite of poverty. You have to think about this for this. Is, this is one of these clever titles. Why the opposite of poverty isn't the American dream. So one of the key things that you do in doing Helping Hurts, and then you do it again in this book, is help us understand what poverty is. Yeah. Like, so yeah. we, we think of poverty one way. And I'll let you say it. I, I, I've quoted you too many times, Sam. I'll let you say it. That's okay. So, so if you ask most Americans what's poverty, we'll define it as a lack of some material thing, lack of right. food, lack of clothing, lack of shelter. And because we tend to define poverty as a lack of some material thing, our solutions tend towards providing material things to poor people. Uh, or we can get more sophisticated and say, you know what? I don't want to just give them handouts. I want them to be like me. I want them to work hard, earn a lot of money so they can cover their own expenses. The problem is neither of those are working very well. The handout solution creates unhealthy dependencies. We all know that. Right. But the economic empowerment strategy isn't working that well either. Again, we've got all kinds of stuff, but we're miserable. Uh, anxiety and depression are on, on, on the rise. Communities are falling apart. Families are falling apart. The political system is a mess. And I actually think that's due to the economic empowerment strategy and what's lurking behind it. So what is the, and you talk about this, what is the economic theory that's at the heart of this? That's a terrific question. So, so at the heart of Western style capitalism, and at the heart of globalization is this creature that economists <laughs> refer to as homo economicus. Right. You don't really have a date with homo economicus. <laughs> so, 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 and it flows out of a Western naturalist understanding of what a human being is. And it basically says the human being is fundamentally a material creature. There's no soul and it's an autonomous creature. Relationships don't matter. Mm. And we're kind of this consuming robot. So a happiness for homo economicus comes from more stuff. Well, how can people like get more stuff? You either give it to them, and then we kind of get sick of that. It's expensive and it creates dependencies, or you can empower them economically. And that's essentially what Western style economics is based on. Let's help people to get jobs. Let's help them to earn more income. And as they earn more income, they can buy more stuff. Now, 
you know, Satan is so tricky because there's some good things in that, right? Right, we sure. We want people to be economically empowered. We want them to have jobs. We want them to prosper economically. The problem is that we uh, tend, human beings tend to turn good things into idols. Mm. And so uh, instead of saying, you know, work is um, uh, uh, an offering to God, work is part of worship. Work is how we honor and serve our creator. We're wired for work. Adam and Eve are told in the garden, be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, subdue the earth. Work is central to us, but it's work as service. It's work as love to God and to others. Right. But homo economicus isn't loving God and others. Homo economicus is loving himself by greater and greater consumption. Well, the systems we've created, the structure of the global system, the way that companies are formed, the narratives that we're living into are all shaping us increasingly into homo economicus, a self-centered, highly materialistic, hyper-individualistic creature. And we're not made for that. Mm -hmm. We're made for something else. So we need a different story, a different system, different practices for ourselves and for the materially poor for us to all flourish. Well, and this is what I find interesting as somebody who kind of works in more theological disciplines is that the way you come at this is through, and it, I don't know if you say this directly, the theological anthropology. That's what it is. Like, yeah. And, and it's almost it's like it this book is an economic, I don't oh, know, this is, this is, maybe this is an economic appropriation of a proper biblical anthropology. That's it. That's hey, the whole thing. There you go. Okay. I could be a Wesleyan. Hey, I think you are. I'm going to claim you. I'm going to claim no. you. Becoming whole. This, you could say becoming holiness. This is it. I know you're at Covenant College. Uh, but there are, your president wrote a book called Holiness. We're going to call it contextualization for Wesleyans. It's becoming holiness. I'm with you. But it's exactly right. It's a, it, We're trying to say there is a biblical anthropology. Yeah. And uh, Western civilization doesn't have it. And I don't believe the Western church has it. Okay. Now, so, so what, what is that? And now if you want to get the detail answer from a philosopher, check out my podcast with Steve Blakemore on what is a soul, but tell me, Brian, what, in your view, what, what is it that makes us up? What are we as people? Well, right, I'm, individuals? Speaking, I'm speaking to somebody who knows more about this than I do. So this is terrifying, but, nah. but uh, basically in becoming whole, we argue that, um, that uh, uh, Bible-believing Christians in Western civilization have essentially adopted what we call an evangelical Gnostic framework. Gotcha. That basically, yep. the body and the soul are completely separate from one another. The body kind of contains the soul the way that um, a glass might contain water. And so the glass holds the water, but the glass and the water are not intertwined. And mm -hmm. you can pour the water out and you can kind of pour the soul out. And, and, and in this story, uh, the goal is to get the soul to heaven, uh, to float around on clouds, uh, wearing diapers and playing harps for all eternity. <laughs> and it's not really a story for the body. And so we don't, we don't know what to say. And so we just revert to the only story we know, which is the story of the American dream. People need more stuff. We either give it to them, we help them earn it. So it's kind of live your best life now and get your soul to heaven for all eternity. Right, right. That's not what we're wired for. Yeah. So what the Bible teaches, I think, is that the body and soul are highly integrated. And so we're not just bodies that contain souls, we're body, soul, mixture thingies. And then the most important thing, quite frankly, uh, or one of the most important things for our work is to say, that the Bible also suggests that human beings are deeply relational creatures. Right. So we're highly integrated body, soul, relational thingies. So that what happened <laughs> to us. So what yeah, happened, I like that technical description. Uh, thingies. Yeah, 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 that's good. We're thingies. So, so what happens to us relationally. Yes. Affects us spiritually and physically. And that matters. Yes. Because when that woman walks into our church asking for help with her electric bill, if we're thinking of her as a material creature, we're going to give her stuff. Right. If we think the goal is to get her soul to heaven, we're going to give her stuff and then give her a tract to share the process of salvation to get her soul to heaven. Yeah. If we think that she's a body soul relational creature, we're going to say, man, human flourishing, 
is to live in right relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, yes. and with creation. And, and something is preventing that from happening here. We can talk about what that is. And my goal is to help restore this person to right relationship. That's what human flourishing looks like. And suddenly it's not going to be about stuff. It's going to be about empowering, loving relationship across time. So the methodology, this isn't just a bunch of abstract seminary stuff like you guys deal with. Uh -huh. I'm in the real world, buddy. And I want to get something done. <laughs> I want to get something done. And I want to help that lady. Yeah, I sure. For her. And, and so it's going to take a relational kind of approach. Now, I like too how you highlight in this book that you, there's another dimension too. And I think you just alluded to it just a little bit there that, and I like how you don't back away from this, that there is a spiritual dimension too, even demonic influence. And look, if you've in, in at 14 years and in, in a sense, a lifetime of working in the Salvation Army, there's, if, if you ignore the de demonic aspect, you're missing one of the things that is uh, contributing to whatever. Now, again, it's not helpful to go along and say that somebody's in poverty because they're possessed by a demon, but certainly there is some, an enemy of our souls that, and, and that works through systems and you don't back away. You're not a pull it yourself up by your own bootstrap sort of guy altogether, but it, it's, it, there's a couple of angles. Like there is a, a sometimes personal decision, sometimes a sy systemic sort of concerns, but sometimes demonic. I like how you like, thank you. As academic, you did not back away from something that is totally biblical. You know, we're currently, Andy, by the way, my primary spiritual gift is offending people. So some people <laughs> got love, joy, peace. I got offensiveness. So, so I'm going to really irritate everybody in your audience right now. But, Great. But, but, you know, there's this ridiculous debate going on right now in the American church, and it's not a new debate, but it's kind of resurrected its ugly head again. Are people poor because of their individual sin or are people poor because of structural injustice or broken systems? And everybody's fighting over this. Yeah, yeah. Well, just go ask kids in Sunday school at the Salvation Army. What, what has the fall of humanity affected? They're going to mm. say everything. Uh-huh. It's affected everything. It's affected us as individuals. It's affected systems. And post-fall, post-Genesis 3, as you're mentioning, demonic forces have been given greater latitude in the created order. And so why are people experiencing broken relationships with God, self, others, and the rest of creation? Because of individual sin, because of broken systems, and because of demonic forces. The church has said for many, many years, uh, we're fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's just that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It, 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 you can't miss and part of an interesting thing of this uh, study I put together on Jude is uh, the emphasis that comes in uh, highlighting Genesis 6 verses 4 and following, which is, seems a little odd and strange. But yet there's this definite demonic sort of complete influence. And I like how you help me sing joy to the world better because, like as you said, this influence is far as the curse is found. That's it. Right. This is, this is, this, it, it, it's not, it's not one or the other, but, but yet yeah, we still make, tr we still have problems in, I, I said, you, you help, since your spiritual gift is offending people, you <laughs> help me offend many people, Brian. Oh, you're welcome. I'm, spread, <laughs> I'm spreading the gift. I bring, I, I just bring your books and I hold them up and I, I proclaim what you say and people get mad at me. So I stopped. I stopped a, a, a soup kitchen uh, as a result of when helping hurts and not be not I don't bl just blame. I just and I, I stopped going on the street in a very compassionate oriented way, going around and feeding people on the street. Instead, what I want to say is like we're going to get people into a sh and once they make a commitment to get into a shelter and they get into a program and get into a relationship where we're going to look at the details of what's going on in somebody's life. We're, I, I use kind of inflammatory language. I think the spirit of Brian came upon me. <laughs> I, I just said, we are not going to, like, we're not going to, we're going to stop throwing food at people. That's it. That's we're going to stop throwing Christmas gifts at people. Uh, what, 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 because what am I saying when I do that? That the answer to your problem is your lack of stuff. That's it. Right? So it's, and I like, again, how you bring up this, this is a relational piece, the, the, the various aspects of our relationships being highlighted, that it's not just it, it, our, our relationship with God and what we end up doing, we act in a paternalistic way, where we assume that somebody needs our work, we need, we, we, we are the hero who's come That's in it. to save people. That's and, it. As a, 
Yeah, keep go you go ahead and comment. I, I didn't have a good question there, but I, I go ahead and comment oh, on what I'm it. saying. You know, uh, I, what we're really trying to do, Andy, is to root our understanding of poverty, as you were mentioning earlier, in a biblical anthropology. Mm -hmm. and, and what I have found helpful is to start to think of it this way. Uh, God creates human beings as these body-soul relational creatures, and then he puts them in a habitat that's conducive to flourishing for that kind of creature. So, so he put fish okay. in the ocean, he put uh, giraffes in wherever he put them, and, 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 and he put human beings in a setting that was conducive to flourishing for that kind of creature. Okay. Well, that's the Garden of Eden. And, and, and so in the garden, human beings had a deep communion with God mm -hmm. and a deep communion with others, Adam and Eve, uh, a sense of dignity and worth as image bearers. And then God says to them, be fruitful, and multiply, increase in numbers, subdue the earth. He gives them a task. That's the relationship to creation. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the fall happens, right? And so all of that's distorted, but the image of where it's all going isn't uh, souls that float around like ghosts. Right, right, it's right. Restored Eden. The imagery in scripture is restored Garden of Eden, where once again the dwelling of God will be with with people, and we will have our old jobs back. In Revelation, it Amen. says we're going to be restored as priest rulers. That was the initial job of Adam and Eve: be priest rulers, and that's what we're going to we're going to get our old jobs back. Amen. That's the thing. Amen. It's such a it's such a much more pleasing, not a helpful picture. Like this is like what God has put this desire in in us to, for another world. Uh, if, if those are interested in this, go back to my series. I have a three part series on heaven and what we mean by heaven. And Brian, you might like this. I don't know. Maybe you might you might be more of a cat person. But it, that I my final one is: Will my dog be there? So you have to check it out. You have to uh, check it out. Dogs are gonna make it. Cats are not. No. I, well, you and I are together on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just lost half the people. They just signed off. They're they're gone. They're gone. So, okay, you have a good uh, uh, summary sentence for me that comes on. Let me see, page one hundred three. Giving ongoing handouts and an evangelistic message to able-bodied people, and you clarify, able-bodied people is a terribly common case of when helping hurts. It's, it's the most. It's it's the biggest problem we have. So so. Uh, in When Helping Hurts, we make a distinction, distinction between relief and rehabilitation and development. These are three different uh, approaches to helping the poor, and each of them has a role in certain settings. So relief is a handout. Right. Uh, this isn't the point of the parable of Good Samaritan, but the Good Samaritan applied relief appropriately. The dude's lying there on the side of the road bleeding to death. He can't help himself. And so the Good Samaritan gives him stuff. That's completely appropriate when there's a crisis and the person is incapable of contributing to their own improvement. Mm -hmm. But once the bleeding is stopped, uh, we should ask people to participate in their own recovery process. Not because we're uptight, stingy Republicans, although we might be, but it's mm -hmm. not because of that's because we want to restore them to image bearing. And to be an image bearer is to steward our gifts, use our gifts, uh, to develop those gifts, to help rule over God's creation. And so we ask people in rehabilitation to, to start to contribute. So, so maybe the dude with the, the Good Samaritan story doesn't tell us the rest of the story, but once the guy is kind of starting to recover and he's starting to uh, uh, maybe do some physical therapy, we ask him to contribute. We're not going to carry or move his legs for him. He has to contribute to his physical therapy. Why? Because you want to restore him. Mm -hmm. Then development is helping people and communities to achieve higher levels of flourishing than ever before. And here's the problem. The vast majority of poor people in the world need development not relief. Mm. They're not in a crisis. They're in a chronic state of poverty, mm -hmm. but they, they're able-bodied. They can contribute to their own improvement. And what the number one problem we have is that churches and Christian ministries apply relief in contexts where development is the right intervention. And we do it over long periods of time and it cripples people. It undermines their dignity and undermines their capacity there's this huge irony. I, there's probably one or two Republicans listening on this podcast. I'm just thinking, just guessing. Yeah, probably. And, probably, you know. And, and, you know, many of us who are more conservative politically are very critical of the federal government's welfare programs. Mm -hmm. But then we do the same things in our churches and ministries. Absolutely. 
And yeah. so we're, we're creating all those kinds of dependencies by doing relief in context where development is the right intervention. And it undermines good, good poverty alleviation work. Yeah, it's, it's so important to be able to see that distinction. And it, 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 like in your book is it moving in that direction to help both, both your books. And then not only that, it helps us to see the way that it hurts us when we do that. It's yeah, not totally. just it's not just that we're crippling a, a group of people, though we are. It's also that we're hurting ourselves because we, we get this uh, idea that we're actually helping. You know, a typical situation um, in the context of the Salvation Army is um, somebody will come in and they'll say, I want to volunteer. I want to do something. OK, great. Um, be, and then the answer might be, I want to bring my kids because I want them. I want them to see how good they have it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, what if, what about the people we're serving who are creating God's totally. image? Yeah. Like, are, do you want me to create a zoo? Like I could, I could do that where you can see that such a thing exists. I mean, that's, that's almost what people want in those experiences. Now I actually, I tried to be sympathetic in that moment that I was at that point as well. And I have other deficiencies I'm sure at this moment that I'm aware of, but it's it, me enabling you to continue under this idea is not serving you. It's like not now that I know the truth, it's not helping. It's got it. to be aware of that. There's an interesting um, a lady in uh, Uganda once wrote an article, uh, a letter to the editor in the New York Times, and she basically said, "Stop giving your kids a great week experience at my kids' expense. I'm wow. tired of you folks coming over and treating my kids like they're animals in a zoo that you're all looking at." Wow. And so, so we do real harm there. Another dimension of the harm is this. Um, uh, all of us are suffering from broken relationships. They yeah. just bubble up in different ways in our lives. And so um, I'm experiencing a broken relationship with self. Hmm. Uh, we all are. But the way that my broken relationship with self tends to interact with that same brokenness in the poor is a really big problem because many of us uh, are full of pride, mm. are full of a sense of, I worked harder, I achieved, I accomplished it. I'm not like that homeless person. Mm. So we have a sense of pride. Uh, we have a sense of superiority. And then when we uh, work with people who are materially poor, they're off for off often suffering from a sense of shame, a sense yes. of incapacity, a sense of being less than human. Yeah. So they tend to be a little passive. So what happens is I rush in, I take over, I try to fix them. Yep. And they don't respond because I haven't really empowered them. I've communicated, right. you need me to fix you. And they become more passive. And then mm -hmm. I get more disgusted. I knew they were good for nothing. I knew they were wow. lazy. And so their shame is enhanced and my pride is enhanced. And so their way out is the gospel, the good news of the gospel. And the good news of the gospel is not that you and I are okay. The good news of the gospel is that we're not okay. And Amen. that Jesus is okay. Amen. This is, and I like where this, this prequel sequel book that you have points us in that bigger story, this bigger picture of where we're going, like what we're trying to do in poverty alleviation, <laughs> not just there. It's it's something more. Now, uh, the, the, the kind of typical examples that people would use uh, who are looking for help and trying to figure out what to do, trying to be active in community. I'm going to give you another one that is that you reminded me of when you said that, of like what we do when we come in. And it's it's a typical story in my denomination and, and in other denominations that also sir, kind of have uh, at their origin reaching out to people who are working class or um, people who are in poverty. Yep. And it's this story. And I, and I did it. I, I would go in to a low income housing area or the projects. And I would uh, with a, a bus with our church's logo on it. And then I get a group of kids that would come. I could, I could almost guarantee I could make this happen in any community. Right. And I could have 50, to 75 kids, any, and then get to know some of those kids, work with them, creating God's image. But what ended up happening a lot of times was I would knock on the door. I get to know the families. I would even walk in and uh, the parents wouldn't respond. And I would then say, um, all right, kids, let's wake up. Everybody get going, get dressed. We're going to go to Sunday school and we're going to, we'll give you breakfast and lunch and we'll make sure everything's taken care of. And there would be good stories that would happen. But I realized I, 
later and I look back at dozens, hundreds of these situations, I was stepping in and I wasn't enabling the parents to be parents. That's it. Like and and create what what was ultimately needed. Now, like I'm I'm thinking some of those situations are people who have who have so so called made it, not the quite the American dream, but they're made it out. And maybe there's part of the work that we did that contributed to that. But I look back and say, you know, what would have been the better use of my time there? Is like and the same thing happens. I've seen it on men's faces when we give angel tree gifts to people. Right? We're we're kind of saying you can't provide for yourself, so I'm gonna get your Christmas gifts for you. You want to respond to that? <laughs> Dude, that's it. So, 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 um, you know, when helping hurts, I would tell a story of a church that, um, the pastor was preaching about outreach and care for the poor and praise God for all that. And so the church members decided to, uh, go to door to door and hand out turkeys and toys, uh, turkeys at Thanksgiving toys at Christmas time. Well, uh, uh, nothing ever changed. Year after year, they're doing the turkeys and toys things and nothing's changing. And after a while, the people in this church started to go, you know what? These people are good for nothing. Mm. Uh, they, 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 they don't want to work. They're lazy. And uh, did you ever notice there's no men in these households? Uh, these are women who are having children out of, well, out of wedlock. These are welfare mothers. And so the pride in the church members is going up. Well, the church did some more research, and they found out there actually were men in those homes, husbands and fathers. Mm. But for a variety of reasons, both systemic and personal and demonic, they had a hard yes. time uh, finding and keeping work, and they were ashamed of it. Mm. So when these when these black fathers see a bunch of white folks coming at them with turkeys and toys, turkeys and toys they can't afford to provide for their own kids, they ran out the back doors of their houses and hid behind garbage cans in the bushes. They didn't have to endure the shame of all these white church people coming in. Wow. And what, what that does is real harm. Because mm. those men who are already struggling with their self-images are already struggling with their sense of inadequacy. The message to them in front of their kids and their wives is, you really do stink. And wow. so it's actually very disempowering. Wow. It, 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 what would you say, say to some of these uh, turkeys and toys sort of programs? Like, but by the way, Brian, you also helped me stop a turkey drive. Um, I, I'm shutting down Thanksgivings <laughs> and Christmases, and I'm kind of like the Grinch. <laughs> yeah, I, I had somebody. Uh, I, I actually don't blame you. I, like, I, I think we might have this a similar personality. I'm willing to take it. Uh, I we had somebody who would give as many turkeys as we would. They they would write the check, as many turkeys as we could give away. They would pay for. I'm I am talking truckloads of of turkeys okay so they're they're willing to do that and the the problem is it looks really good and you know you know what i i get and uh in the salvation army pick that i could get the tv uh, stations would all of them would come out to watch me give away turkeys give and, and you know what i would say say this year and with our angel g program we did not just five thousand we did we gave away ten thousand gifts wow andy captain andy you're doing so good but am i <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Is that a good thing that we have more people to serve? You know, <laughs> so, so I'm sorry. I caught you. I, I, I got you at a good moment. It's four o'clock in the afternoon for me, but it, boy, I, I'm in, I'm enjoying this so much. So forgive me for, I, I don't know what you're pulling out of me, but I, it's, it's a fun moment. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So, so I, I think what, okay. Look, there's no recipe, there's no formula that tells us exactly what to do in every situation, okay? But ask yourself the following question. What's God's story? It's mm. creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Yeah. That's the story of scripture. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And so the whole redemption consummation piece is about restoring all of creation, mm -hmm. including humanity, mm -hmm. So what we're created to be. So just to ask yourself, is what we're about to do uh, moving in the direction of restoration? Well, think about the family. When I give turkeys uh, and toys to people and I undermine the dignity of the father and mother, is that consistent with restoration of the family? It's not. Mm. Consistent with restoration of the family is for the parents to be able to provide for their kids. And for their right. kids to see mom and dad being loving and providing for them. So just think creatively, how can I help that family be what it's created to be. Well, a simple solution that many have pursued is you have a Christmas store in which you uh, allow the parents to come in and shop 
at a very a discounted rate for the turkeys and the toys, and they can bring them home. And suddenly they're the heroes in their kids' eyes, not Men. us as the outsiders. And so it's Men. just always the story of restoration, restoring individuals, restoring families, restoring communities. How can we go in the direction of Colossians chapter one, where Jesus Christ is described as the creator and sustainer and reconciler of all things, to reconcile us, to put things back into right relationship again. We mm -hmm. ought to be those people who are best known for restoring proper relationships. That's the thing. Amen. Uh, I love that, Brian. And uh, uh, one of the things that happens is that it's it's hard to make this move to do less. Like I said, essentially, I think you have to do less. For the, for the churches that are doing large outreach programs like this, and they, they get a lot of volunteers out, they get a lot of energy behind it, to do the type of thing where you're looking at individuals and getting to know individuals and the systemic, the personal, the demonic influences that have led them to a place where, wherever they are, how, how do you help them out? Well, you can't serve 10,000. I don't know. What do That's you think? Can exactly you? Exactly right. That's exactly right. You've got to instead of instead of uh, writing uh, ten thousand uh, checks this year for electric bills, you got to focus in on fifty, mm. on fifty people that you're going to walk with across time. So when uh, when you say do less, I would say probably smaller numbers of people, but you're actually doing more. Yes, because what we're, we're, you're just focusing in more intensely on a smaller number of those people who really uh, want help. Uh, but what I'm describing isn't less work and it's not less money. Mm. You know, a lot of people think that what we're saying is uh, pull back, don't give as much. What we're saying is give more, mm. but give it differently. Give it to ministries and organizations that are willing to walk in highly relational, empowering ways, which is far more expensive than dispensing turkeys and toys. Yes. So what I'm talking about is way more expensive in terms of time, in terms of energy, in terms of uh, um, social capital, it's way more taxing, mm. way more expensive. Isaiah 58 says we're to spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry. Mm. This is way more than writing a check. It's way more than a short-term mission trip. It's much more. Mm. So it's more, but probably more intensely with a smaller number. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that is the answer. If we can get to that place where we can, an answer for us, well, you know, maybe one of the critiques would be, well, Brian, the thing is like when I give away the turkeys and toys or I, or I, or I go out in the street and I hand out meals or it's, it's, it's a start and we have to get people in some way. Um, what do you think is, is that a good way to get people in? Into so, so I, I think the answer to that is very context specific. And so it's hard sure. to get one size fits all answer, but um, I, Material resources should be given in the context of relationship. And, and so yeah. people, people start, to, people take what I'm saying to stupid things. Don't be stupid. So, so yeah. let me give you an example. <laughs> I, I was speaking somewhere and there was two young ladies who came up to me and they said, Dr. Ficker, we applied exactly what you said. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, um, we were, we were staying on a street corner and there was a little old lady, she was 95 years old and she asked us to help her across the street. Oh no! And we said, no, because we don't want to create unhealthy dependencies. So we cheered for her as she hobbled across the street. I think, <laughs> I'm going to face Jesus someday. He's going to say, Brian, little old ladies don't get walked across the street anymore. <laughs> don't be stupid. So, yeah, so I have, yeah. a, I have a friend who is, um, uh, who struggles with homelessness yeah. And do yeah. I give him Christmas presents? Yeah, I do. Of course I do, because he's my friend. I give him a Christmas present. Right. In the context of a relationship and a narrative in a way of behaving with him that says, brother, what are your gifts? What are yeah. your abilities? How can we walk together? But we're not saying become a jerk. Mm. Give him a Christmas present. So yeah, it's sure. how you're doing it. Yeah, it's, and, and that comes in the context of relationship. One of the things that happened in, um, so we had a, a I would say a large emergency shelter. And so we had to figure out how, how is it going to work? And what, what we came up with a relational question. And now it might not seem like that at first, but before anybody would come into shelter, we'd ask the question, do you want to be housed? Yes. Do Great you question. want to be housed? And what that did then was say, okay, if you could say yes to that, that means that within 24 hours, we're going to have a, a system around you 
to walk you through what it takes to be housed. Now, there, this isn't like a, uh, we're not in the business of saying, do you, um, what do you want? You want a bed? I'll give you a bed. You want some food? I'll give you food. Do you, what's your goal? And I think that that's what this, this book is, is pointing us to is like, we want to develop a better goal for people. And that's not just getting housed. Like, that's one thing. Instead, it's into this relationship that's not just taking our evangelical Gnosticism and putting it on display and saying we're going to have a our souls going to heaven and hopefully things work out well for you now. But it's a look at a new creation. I <laughs> love this book, Brian. <laughs> I love the Salvation Army. Do you? Yeah. Now tell me about that. So, Hi. so, so, because <laughs> I think the Salvation Army could use a lot more Brian Fickert. Well, it's, you know, so uh, my father is a pres was a Presbyterian minister. I apologize for that to your audience, but, you know, okay. eventually, you know, but then in my mother's side of the family for generations were Salvation Army officers. I've got cousins who are Salvation Army officers. I love the Salvation Army. I think part of, part of, I have felt called to work amongst the poor since I was a kid. Okay. I think partly because of that Salvation Army influence. Now, in your grandfather was uh, the ARC commander, so he yeah. helped all the. And I think it's interesting. That's one program that really kind of puts a lot of this into into play, like the the if work. Done properly, yeah, yeah. I don't know how he was doing. I don't know. I was too <laughs> young, but um, I'll tell you a funny story. So, so he was, yeah. so he was in the retired officers' residence in Asbury Park. Oh yeah, my yeah, great grandmother yeah. lived there. I love that place. Okay. So when I was a little kid. I used to get to visit that. Yeah, and it had kind of like a um, I don't know, like kind of a like historical part that was sort of a tribute to William Booth. Mm -hmm. And so my grandfather, I was a little kid, my grandfather takes me in there and he points my head around. There's, there's busts of William Booth. There's portraits of William Booth. It's like the William Booth temple, you know, and he, turns, <laughs> he, so he shows me all this. He says, Brian, who was the greatest man that ever lived? Oh, wow. Well, I couldn't say William Booth. Cause I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Jesus Christ. And so, so I got through that one. All right. But I love, I love the Salvation Army. I love the folks there. Great people. Yeah. We, uh, I'm glad you didn't get in trouble for not saying William Booth. There's a, you know, he has a beard. He looks very similar. Jesus, you know, maybe people get, well, I noticed sometimes. that I wasn't in the will in the end. So maybe that maybe. Oh, I'm maybe that's it. Now, now you wanted to ask me a question you know, if it, before we got in. Yes, Andy, I understand that, you know, I'm just getting to know you uh, on this thing, but I understand that you're kind of thinking the Salvation Army should use the sacraments a little bit. What's that all about? Yeah, so you might not know, maybe you know through your family tradition that for the first several years of the Salvation Army's uh, history, we did practice the traditional Protestant oh, sacraments. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. so found in 1865. And as the Salvation Army is developing, uh, 13 years after uh, the start became the Salvation Army, no longer the Christian mission. And this military metaphor picked up, and there's this real sense that like, if we just apply these methods, the whole world can come to Jesus. And let's just not get too caught on things that divide people. And also, we're not really a church. And so let's just focus on getting people saved. And after all, there was some theological justification for this too. Um, the, the idea of holiness being this uh, concept that we are in ourselves, our lives are a sacrament. Um, these are all like kind of ideas that uh, we wanted to move away from ritualistic Christianity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But sadly, what happens is we created our own ritualistic Christianity <laughs> and it involved uniforms and ranks and some things that God has used, right? And we created our own sacraments mm -hmm. and we really, no matter how we can say it, sociologically are a church. And so there's a resistance to the idea of the language of church. And so even William Booth in 1883, when he moves away from the sacraments, says we're, um, since we're not a church, you know, we won't, we don't need to do this. And, 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 and really this is in the context of the church of England. Like right, that's who right, the church right, was. Right, there right. weren't churches. Like we have our denominations. So all of this kind of enters into this stew of confusion about an identity. And yep. really what, what needs to happen, I think clearly a salvation army is a church. We're part of the universal church. We have very orthodox doctrines. We might not be Presbyterians, Brian, but we are in this like Wesleyan tradition. And all of that's because this is the one thing that's unique. It's this strange thing that we have, and it really separates us and at times keeps us out of deeper communion with other Christians because they question um, rather not we're a part of the church. I get that. 
So why do you want to bring this? So given the, the potentials for abuse, for ritualism, for division, why do you want the sacraments to be brought back in? What, 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 you got along well without them. What do you need them for? Yeah, well, I just I, I, a couple of reasons. It's because I have the Brian Ficker, Ficker in me. I like to <laughs> challenge things and I'd like to make people mad. Uh, so I, um, I'm in this situation where I think one, the, the most com com reason is scripture. Like scriptures are incredibly clear yes. and we've gone back and reinterpreted scripture our own, our own way. And, and there's some clever ways that you could say things, but essentially we're moving against the history of interpretation of scriptures first. Secondly, it's, I call the good thing argument. It's a really good. Yeah. Taking the Lord's supper is yeah. a beautiful thing. The public declaration of this, of, of baptism is yeah. connecting you to the church universal. Yeah. Um, and then also our connection to the universal church. Like yep. I think the Salvation Army, as you've highlighted, has something unique to offer the church yep. as a whole. Not that we, are, not that church is wrong, but like we have a unique flavor and it's not our non-sacramentalism. It's the fact that God's called us to proclaim a holistic gospel and Great. we do it in a unique way. So I think we that message is minimized because of people are suspect of us, other denominations. I love that. I love that. And actually, in becoming whole, we make the rather strange argument that the Lord's Supper is part of poverty alleviation. Hello. Not, not because our bellies are being filled with that little, <laughs> that little tiny piece of bread, but human beings are hardwired to dwell in God's presence. Yes. When, and, and this goes back to what's human flourishing. Mm. So, so when Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, it's not just a change of address. Yeah, we're hardwired to dwell in the very presence of God in the image of the new heavens and new earth. The first thing we read in Revelation 21 is now the dwelling of God is with people. We're wired to dwell in God's presence. Yeah, yeah. And I believe the sacraments are part of how God's presence is communicated to us right now. So I actually believe that the Lord's Supper is part of poverty alleviation. Amen. Yeah, it's, it, it's so interesting. Like, uh, in, in poverty alleviation, as I you know, worked in that, uh, when people come in and get involved in a Salvation Army church, I, I would have people who we walk through in, in a great, like becoming whole way and ca came to Christ, got things straightened out. We're developing disciplines. And, and then when they find out we don't practice the sacraments, uh, I'm going back to the Presbyterian church. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> so, that's your, so it's kind of a church growth strategy for us Presbyterians. We don't do any evangelism. We don't do any outreach. You do it and then get them in our, our doors. I love that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. I have one more question for you. Yeah. And that's uh, connected to my the, the title of a podcast, More to Story. There's like a theological meaning behind that. There's more than just being saved, that we have the opportunity to experience God's sanctifying grace. But there's also, there's probably more to the story than Brian Fickert normally gets to tell. Like, so is there something else that you don't, you, you, you lecture on this, talk about these themes a lot, but is there something about you that's distinct, a hobby or something that you don't talk about a lot? Green Bay Packers, man. I grew oh, up no. in the far south of Lambeau Field and the Packers are God's team. And you're going to tell me that you have some other team. I can look on your, who's your team? No. Oh my goodness. Who's your team? The Bears. Oh, brother, let's talk about last Sunday. <laughs> the, 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 the kingdom was brought to bear oh, on the bears. Oh, my goodness. We had a great first drive. You have to admit, we were we really ripped you up that first drive. We did. And um, then that was it. Oh, uh, well, this might not, I might not be able to publish a podcast with a Green Bay Packer fan. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Brian, uh, we, I've had way too much fun. So thank you for your time today uh, and for coming on this podcast. And thanks for your work as an economist and as a theological economist. It mm -hmm. means a lot to the church to have somebody like you speaking into its life and, um, and your co-authors too. I don't mean to leave them out, but um, it's really meant a lot to my wife's and my ministry. And um, also I think to the kingdom as a whole. So thank thanks, you. Thanks brother. It's a joy to be with you. Mm -hmm.